Um, I'd like to present uh, some background about this Finoac dev server that um, if you've been following along the mailing list or if you've had a look at the uh, Finoac readme recently, you might have heard about. Um, I am just introducing myself real quick. For those of you who don't know me, I've been involved with um, what used to be Mifos and is now Apache Finoac for 10 years. It was actually kind of how I got started in open source personally. I currently work at Google by day, but I'm presenting here in a personal capacity on a day um, off from work. This is not a Google product or a Google offering or anything like that, just to avoid any confusion anybody might have. Um, I think I can skip the slide what Apache Finoract is. We just heard from Maria about why it's important. I think many of you are here because you know what Finoract is. So I will skip over this. Um, why and what of uh, finoract.dev? Real, real quick sort of goal, and then we'll come back to this at the very end of the presentation. Um, what I wanted to do was run a demo instance of Apache Finoract uh, for the community. I gave another presentation yesterday uh, titled Reinvigorating the Community, where I briefly touched upon why I thought this was useful and important. Um, let me see if the light here can be changed. Yeah, I think this will look a bit better. Um, and the reason is that we have, of course, the source code up, and of course, we have distributions, uh, zip files that can be downloaded with the code. But until recently, uh, the Apache Finorac project did not have a place where the latest and greatest code could be seen running. Um, I believe this is useful so that people can very easily try out our software. Um, and I also think it's useful that we have it uh, always having the latest and greatest software. So it's fine and interesting to have uh, releases from whatever many months ago running somewhere. But I think for an open source project, it's important for people to be able to immediately see changes and fixes running live, right? Somebody contributes a pull request, somebody fixes something. Um, it's cool to have a place where that's just ready, up and running. Um, so that was that was the goal of Finrack.dev, right? Um, I wanted this to be really easy to use. So something that was, you know, not running on my server at home only when I had it switched on, but like really always up, really highly available anytime. I wanted to make sure there was no need to register anywhere, just a basic, simple default login and password um, really for, for demo purposes, right? To make the, the barrier to entry, so to speak, really low. I have set this up on um, GCP, the Google Cloud, uh, primarily because I was already familiar with it. There isn't much going on here with me working at Google or with Google being a better cloud than Azure or Amazon. I'm sure they're all great and um, uh, people implementing Finoac can deploy it wherever they like. I happen to um, have already deployed other things in Google Cloud. So for me, it was easy to uh, do this there instead of learning a new cloud. Um, running uh, something on a cloud, on, on any cloud, uh, always costs something. So most clouds have some sort of trial tier going or some scheme. Um, it's the same on, on the cloud that I chose. Um, for a demo environment, it's actually not that expensive. I mean, it's all relative, but I'm running it on a fairly low end configuration. Um, and I'm thinking of paying for this demo instance as basically just another way in which I contribute to the project. Um, in case there are people who are interested in how much exactly this costs, I think it's easier not to provide details or something like that because the cost of running a demo instance versus a production instance, I think, could be a little bit different, right? So for uh, actual production deployment, um, you probably need a higher end config of um, application runtime and database. And so let's just say it costs something that, that is okay to uh, pay out of your own pocket for a contributor. Um, I do have a small announcement to make here. Um, that whereas the initial, just setting up a timer here, 40 minutes, the initial setup was was personal. I actually was able to um, get a Google Cloud open source to pay for Finrac.dev for the next year. I think that's really nice of them. It's a way of them to support um, great open source projects such as the Spanish Finrac, which have great traction, of course, many people interested in them. And Google Open Source is happy to sponsor this for a year for cloud hosting costs. That's really cool. 
All right, let's get a bit more technical. Uh, Finner According like, to Wikipedia, oh. CRC. <laughs> Um, it's really easy, right? Finneract, we've made it simple to deploy. I've mentioned this briefly yesterday in the community talk. We have a Docker Compose setup now. We have a fat jar that makes it easy to run. So really all you need is a VM. So G Cloud Compute Instance Create Finneract that creates a VM um, on the command line with the Google Cloud command line interface. And then your favorite package manager, DNF, YAM app, install, MariaDB server or MySQL server, whichever you want to prefer. And you run Finra, all in one VM, all great, right? Um, it, it, it's actually not, it's actually not. There's actually a couple of things that are wrong with that. Um, of course this works, you can run a server like this and you can get this up and running fairly easily now that we've uh, we've made some, some work to simplify it. You don't even need an external Tomcat anymore now that we have this uh, self-sustaining jar file, which we highly recommend over the war deployment now in 1.4.0. But there's a couple of issues with this. Um, and I like to uh, call this the difference between a managed and an unmanaged environment. So if you set up a VM and in this VM you run uh, Finneract or any other application, whether it's written in Java or Ruby or PHP or whatever is your favorite language, you got a lot of things you wanna take care of yourself. Um, this is uh, a slide with too many words on them that just wants to illustrate there's a, a number of things you have to take care of you have to take care of SSL termination. So how your um, HTTPS certificates are set up and ideally how you rotate them after time. Um, if you have a single VM, what happens when that VM goes down? What happens if you need more than one VM because you want to scale? What happens when you need to do a kernel upgrade, um, which you should be doing um, following any recent Linux distribution regularly enough? Um, how do you secure this VM? Um, what ports may be open by default on this? Um, Many Linux distributions come with SSHD running and password login enabled. What if you, um, you know, don't do the work required to harden the box? How do you back up um, a simple VM-based uh, um, setup? Um, I, these problems and many others have all been solved in um, managed environments. So a managed environment is just something that says, what you want to do here is run a database or run a Java application and something takes care of and manages problems like the ones I've enumerated here and others. A managed environment is an orthogonal concern to whether something is a proprietary cloud or open source, right? That is, that is completely separate. There are uh, fully open source managed stacks, which you have to deploy yourself, but then when you deploy the applications on them, the applications are managed. Or all the um, big, uh, closed uh, clouds, whether it's Google Cloud or Amazon or Azure or many of the others. Of course, there are, there are some uh, medium and small cloud players where you get the same offer. You can have a managed environment from many, many vendors. They take care of that as well. Um, and, and with a, a bit of a joke here, um, a managed environment is something where you can tell it's, uh, where you can tell your boss that it's somebody else's problem when it's not working, when it's down. Of course, the application is still on you, but at least all of the um, technical infrastructure is taken care of by somebody else in a managed environment. So that's what I went for on finrec.dev, decided to run in a managed environment. So um, not a VM, um, which is called GC on, on uh, Google Cloud. Um, and that makes sense because while uh, a VM in, in a GC VM is, is fun and your Linux administrator can install packages in it and can, uh, you know, I mentioned set up an SSH a server on it so you can check the log files. That's actually not what you want to do if you think about it, right? If you go back to my first slide, my goal was to get Finneract um, running in the cloud for people to try it out. My goal wasn't to set up a Linux box. My goal wasn't to deal with database backups. As much fun as that sometimes is, I think it's important to um, set yourself a goal and focus on achieving that goal. So if your goal is to run um, a demo instance of Finneract, well then what's the easiest way to do that? There are a couple of managed environments on the Google Cloud. Um, and it's surprisingly confusing, actually, how many options there are. Um, you can, for example, use Google Cloud Run. That is a very low entry product um, that you can just give a container image, a Docker container, um, and it just runs that for you. You don't have to do anything. You just, you get HTTP requests and that container runs. That sounds nice, but for Finneract, that's actually a bad fit. Uh, Cloud Run 
on the Google Cloud actually doesn't work well for Spinrack because a Java Spring Boot application like our architecture takes too long to start up. Um, and Cloud Run uh, optimizes hosting costs by shutting down instances that don't get requests. Um, also, Finneract, of course, has a background scheduler for some of the account processing. Um, that's also not the Cloud Run model. Cloud Run model is really an architecture where you get requests, you serve requests, containers scale up, um, get shut down. You can't have stuff running in the background when you don't get requests. That's not a fit for, for Cloud Run. There's Kubernetes, of course. Many of you know Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the leading winning container orchestration server. Um, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend you all learn about Kubernetes. Um, it's overkill for what we're trying to do here. Go back to my goal. I'd like to run finnerack.dev, where the Finnerack 1.x um, instance is available to anybody who wants to try it at all times. I don't need Kubernetes. Um, there is another thing um, called Google App Engine. Um, that's somewhere in the middle between Kubernetes and Cloud Run in terms of uh, product or um, architecture. And that actually works quite nicely for something like this. A simple Java app, um, even if it had several microservices, like even if it had a couple of different Java apps, but you don't need advanced Kubernetes features. This is a nice managed um, hosting offering. Um, it's confusing because there are two different app engines. The one that um, fits for something like fin uh, Finract is the App Engine Flexible environment, serverless App Engine Flexible. That's the first choice here, but then you have other choices to make. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit while I spoke in detail about the choice of the um, runtime environment for the backend, for the Java part. I'm going to cut short here and just list some of the other choices um, made for running Finract.dev. So for the database, there's something called Cloud SQL which is a managed MySQL database. Finneract, of course, currently runs with MySQL. We don't support any other databases as of right now. So we need that somewhere in, in a cloud. Um, and Cloud SQL is a managed database. So the same thing that um, I explained before about VMs, uh, but long story short, it's something that just runs a database and you don't have to care about backups and you know scaling up the database and monitoring the database. This, um, this basically does that for you. Uh, cloud storage is basically a place where documents can be uploaded. Um, so Finneract supports attaching documents to customers and um, loans and things, and they need to go somewhere. Uh, you can't store them in a container. That doesn't work. It's probably this presentation is too short to explain the very technical details about this. You need a place to store content and cloud storage is for that. Um, that's actually not fully implemented. That's why it's in italics yet, but there's like a long weekend's work left to get that fully done. Um, there is an environment for uh, managing logs. I'm going to speak about this a bit more with some details afterwards called cloud logging and cloud error reporting. Um, there's something called cloud build, which we use to build the container image, something called container registry, which keeps the image. This is worthwhile um, to uh, note because um, this is kind of an alternative to the Docker Hub image. So many of you perhaps know already that Finneract is running um, uh, continuous deployment into Docker Hub, where the latest and greatest code is always available in a container on Docker Hub uh, right now, something I built a few months ago. But you don't actually want your cloud environment to depend on that, right? You don't want to have a dependency to something like Docker Hub. It could go down. It might be less secure um, if you don't trust it. Um, for a cloud deployment that you control, you ideally want to build it from source, and that's relatively easy to do with Cloud Build and Container Registry. Cloud monitoring, yet another of these too many different things um, you need to get your head around to set this up. is a place where you can um, actually see metrics about the database that you're running, the number of requests you get, um, the even inside the VM, the Java JVM, you could check heap usage and whatever you like, basically, how, how much fun you want to have there, how much time you want to invest to, how deep you want to dig. That's all possible with monitoring solutions. And Google Cloud Monitoring is a is one of those. Um, Google Cloud Firebase Hosting, uh, last but not least, is a, a way of hosting static content. Maybe I'll move here on here in the interest of time and um, start explaining details about some of these things from the top to the bottom. So if we start at the front end and then dig ourselves down at the application layer and maybe a few words about the database by the end of the presentation. Um, the front end uh, is, of course, the uh, JavaScript-based applications that we use in Finract to have user interfaces. 
Um, I run them as well on Finrac Dev uh, on these two URLs. Um, they don't need a container, right? You don't need a Kubernetes or a Cloud Run or a um, app engine to just serve static HTML files. That would be complete overkill, obviously. Um, what's fun to do is to serve, excuse me, static web content from a worldwide content delivery network, a CDN. CDN is basically a place that you can throw static files on and then um, have them accessible by HTTP and they get sent to you um, from a content delivery network from a server that's close to you. This uh, makes more sense than running you know, an Apache server in a container or a, a Nginx or whatever your favorite um, static HTML serving um, process is. Uh, this is really easy to set up. Um, this Firebase thing, you can just basically upload a bunch of files and they appear on a URL and get um, served to users from somewhere really close, reducing initial page load, time latency, because they sort of come to you from whatever is close. Um, this is right now, um, these uh, web apps of Affinerac are static. I basically, uh, a few months ago, uploaded the current versions and made them available with the right URLs. Um, and something we'd like to do is that the community app and eventually the web app as well should be auto-deployed on every change as well. The initial focus of interact.dev was much more on the back end. So this is kind of the last slide where, where I'm talking about the front end. If you're interested, subscribe to these issues, maybe even help if you have um, cycles and expertise to help, um, especially in the web app, there's a small change that's needed. It's not actually possible today because the URL is hard-coded. Not, not something big, but something that needs to be sorted out before and we can switch to continuous delivery CD for the front end part. Speaking about CI CD, uh, the back end, the Finneract um, uh, API server is actually continuously deployed. So that was one of the goals that I set out on the first slide. Um, we are actually able to um, have every pull request that's merged show up on finneract.dev live in I think it's about 10 minutes or maybe 12 or 13 minutes or something right now. This should be easy in 2020. Um, it should take a few clicks to hook up a Git repository to do a continuous integration build, um, triggering a continuous deployment to a server environment. And this was surprisingly hard to do. Um, the theory is that there is something called a, a Google Cloud Build GitHub app. So you can press a button and then you can install a GitHub app into a Git repository and then that watches for changes. And then when every time somebody commits something, a pull request is merged, um, it can trigger a build. But that didn't work. Um, the reason for that is that um, Apache Software Foundation hosted Git repositories um, don't accept that these uh, GitHub applications are installed. So Cloud Bill or any other ones, this problem came up in not just for this continuous deployment, but it was also a problem for some of the code quality checks we wanted to set up. There are some of these bots that check code every time you check them in. They don't just work on ASF repos because um, uh, ASF Infra doesn't want to give write permission to ASF repos, which makes good sense, right? You don't want some bot that hasn't been voted in as a committer by a PMC to start changing code. Um, I eventually found a way around this. The full details of how exactly this works are a bit long, but I have a blog post that explains the details. Essentially, the, the convoluted way around this is that um, there is a GitHub action on the Finrac Dev repo. I can pull this up real quick. Now oh, you probably won't see if I change tabs. Well, click on this link um, if you want to see the details. And this GitHub action triggers a cloud build and the problem by doing that is that you need to have this done in a secure way because the credentials to trigger a build inside the Google Cloud project where Finrac Dev runs isn't necessarily something I'd like to um, you know, see abused by somebody just looking at the, at the source code of the GitHub action in the repo. And so GitHub has a way to support secrets and repos. You can actually set a secret that can only be written ones, but that cannot be read back other than by actions. And that's a great fit for this, for managing a credential. It's all described in a blog post I did, I did, I think, three months ago or so, if you want the details about that. With that, uh, any PR goes to production with zero toil, zero manual work. Nobody has to um, press any buttons, launch any scripts. It just works. Um, continuously every time a pull request gets merged. 
The cool thing about this is that this includes scannering and rolling deployment. So um, if somebody's using the Finneract dev instance and somebody merges a change, it looks like it doesn't come down. It looks like there's no interruption because there's some um, magic going on thanks to, again, a managed environment. Um, this is not something that only Google Cloud does. Kubernetes can do this if you take the time to set this up yourself. But on a managed environment, um, on a cloud, this just works. What it basically does is that it keeps running the old version of the app and keeps serving requests on that until the new version is completely up and running. And it has some thing going on that makes sure it's really running. And let's say if we merge the pull request that broke um, the server, the backend, Finneract, uh, this system would be smart enough to even detect that. It, it actually would keep the old version and not roll over to the new version if that, let's say, just kept crashing or something like that. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Talking about crashing and problems and things like that, uh, a word about uh, logging and error reporting and such. So um, I don't know if this is a huge surprise to anybody, but log files are bad. <laughs> log files are stupid. Uh, applications that write log files are, are very 90s. Um, a cloud native application does actually not write log files. A cloud native application just spews out what it has to say to stand it out. If you want more background about why that is so and, and should be like that, please read the 12factor.net um, website, which has 12 points um, that every self-respecting cloud native application should implement. Um, the Finneract container image is actually pre-configured now to not have a log file anymore and just print to stand it out. Uh, most managed cloud environments um, have some system or the other to capture that log output and do something with it. Um, the interesting thing is what you do with these logs once you have taken care of how they're managed and captured. Um, nobody has should, ha should need to read logs, right? Logs contain a bunch of information which you might want to look at if you have a problem, but you shouldn't have to look at logs. Um, things should just work. If you start Finoact, it it should just run. And on the occasional case where there is a problem, it should tell you about it. If there is a you know null pointer exception or a legal state exception or a class cast exception or some real problem in the Java code, that would be interesting to know about. But not that somebody, you know, um, did HTTP get on the client's REST API. There's no need to really know much about that. Google Cloud error reporting is pretty nice for that. It analyzes log files and finds error logs and the stack traces of error logs and allows you to track how often they occurred. Um, that's really neat. Um, I've actually been able to find, uh, meanwhile, something between 30 and 40 bugs in Finneract just by observing what um, some of you have been doing on finneract.dev and having Google Cloud error reporting notify me each time there was an exception. And um, we have these JIRA tickets open. Uh, a good number of them have actually been fixed. That's one of the many improvements that went into release 1.4.0. And there's still some open ones. If somebody wants to help with this, this is a nice way to get engaged with the community and, and help us reduce some obvious errors that happen and that we've been able to observe on our demo instance. This only really works if apps um, follow uh, certain logging policies. I have written up some logging guidelines on the readme file of Apache Finneract. Um, that um, are summarized here. But basically, errors should only be logged for things that are bugs in the application that can be fixed. So there are a number of cases where we, for example, um, have internal server errors that are caused by just simple wrong requests. Um, these wrong requests are because somebody manually tried something out with Postman or maybe a bug in an Android app or something like that. But there isn't anything that Apache Finnerack as the backend can do about that, right? So those kind of conditions need to be sent back as um, errors to the client making the API request. They don't need to be logged in the backend error reporting. In technical terms, what I'm trying to say here is that there's a class of errors that need to cause HTTP 400 responses and a class of errors that need to cause HTTP 500 responses. And sometimes we don't quite get that right. Um, there's still work to be done in Finrac to make this more, more perfect. And those 30 to 40 bucks that I mentioned, uh, a number of them is related to this. The way this looks is like this. On the Google Cloud Platform, on the screenshot here of the backend of Finrac.dev that I run, you can see that in the last 30 days, we've had a number of exceptions. Um, for example, when I took the screenshot three hours ago, earlier in July, I know this is the first occurrence in, in early July, but a few days ago, we still have 
journal entry invalid exceptions. Journal entry cannot be made prior to last account closing date. This is an error that the scheduler runs into, which in an ideal world it shouldn't because we should catch this earlier um, and not even allow a journal entry to be made prior to its account closing date. This is an improvement that I'm hoping sooner or later we'll be able to make Finerec, which will then mean that these 1,041 occurrences of this error on the back end will not happen anymore. Um, or a illegal state exception node, not a JSON array Brazil. This is a, an example of something that should be an error 400, not an error 500. Somebody sent an um, API request there where Brazil was not in a, um, a square bracket for a, a JSON array. This shouldn't be an internal server error. There's absolutely nothing we can do to fix this error. The only thing we can do is to improve the error handling to return this more correctly. And we've had a number of contributions. Petri has done a great job on this. Just another fix, I think, went in yesterday um, to help with some of these problems. Um, this, for example, SQL state exception, this is an actual problem in our data layer, right? Um, there's some queries here which under some condition doesn't quite work. So this is something worth following up. Every time I see one of those, I create a JIRA issue to help the community to um, improve our code and get better. How do I see these issues? Um, I actually get woken up in the middle of the night on my phone about them. No, I'm just joking. I don't actually get woken up because I set this to silent. But I actually have a mobile app from Google Cloud Error Reporting, which pops up every time somebody does a uh, request to the finrack.dev demo server, which causes an exception. This is pretty neat. Um, it's one of the ways in which um, you can do professional monitoring of a uh, server a deployment such as finarec.dev. Um, some of the things I'm showing here are part of a, an approach of running production services, which is called SRE, Site Reliability Engineering. It's a practice that all of the um, big uh, cloud vendors uh, use internally to make sure that their environments keep running. So at Google, there are SREs who make sure that you know Gmail runs and works all the time. And they actually do get woken up at night when uh, Gmail is down. Some of the things that I'm mentioning here are fairly similar to what um, SREs use at uh, uh, cloud companies or at Twitter or any anybody basically who maintains website in production. Um, at the very end of the presentation, there's a book tip for how to learn more about the practice of SRE. Um, Metrics are an important part of, of of this way of running a production environment, right? You don't want to check if your server is running by yourself testing something. You want to have a system that checks that. So on Google Cloud Monitoring, um, you can set up metrics that uh, check how your server is doing. And um, this is an example here. We can see here that the finrec.dev server has had 99.996% uptime over the last, what's the time frame here? Last month, I think. Um, that's pretty neat um, and uh, shows that this is a fairly reliable server, right? There must have been one outage uh, for a few minutes at some point um, where probably something got upgraded. I suspect that would have been the database um, that caused that 0.04% uh, downtime. Um, the way this particular uptime metric checks work works is that it basically every, what's that set up here? Every 300 seconds, every five minutes, it does an HTTP get of all the clients and it expects the response to contain total filtered records. If that were to not work, then this would show up as an error and, and as a spike here, as a not pass check. It would actually pop up on the mobile app as well um, and wake me up at night or not. And, um, uh, measures uh, the response time to this as well. So this is something that you configure. You actually set this up to do it. it. It doesn't just magically know what it has to do. And this is just a first example of a metric. You can set metrics for anything you want. You could check on, you know, database response times or, I don't know, memory consumption on the JVM or uh, basically a few clicks. You can, you can set up any metric you like here. Um, these are just for illustration, a few metrics um, that um, you can monitor. Um, these sort of come out of the box. This takes like 10 minutes to set up or something. Uh, this shows, I think, CPU utilization of the uh, app engine, so that the, the Java container, um, sent bytes. So it looks like um, the get clients response is about 6K 
kilobytes, 6,000 bytes long, because every few minutes we get about 6,000 bytes that are sent back. That's probably the the five minute uh, polar there. And on our demo instance, the SQL queries are really low, right? This is this is peanuts. We got a, a couple of queries um, every second. This is not a production instance. This would look different on a on an environment which was more seriously um, hammered and uh, used, basically. How am I doing on time? I think about 10 minutes or so left. I probably need to speed up a bit. Uh, security. Security is always an interesting topic. What's there to say about security on a managed environment? Um, I think in something like finrac.dev, there's a huge line in security. In a managed environment, you have the security of the infrastructure stack, which is much more to do with how the so, so the managed environment deals with security, and then you have the application security, which has everything to do with Apache Finrac and nothing with Google Cloud. Let's talk about these two separately. Um, in terms of infrastructure security, uh, so Google Cloud, um, generally speaking, I think a managed platform makes security easier than if you run um, you know, your own VM where you install MySQL yourself and things like that. The managed platform provider, whoever runs that managed platform, makes it uh, takes care of some of the security concerns for you. Um, it doesn't mean that it's secure, right? Security is not something, you can't be secure or not secure. Security is, is, is a, a, what's it, grayscale thing left to right. You can be more secure, you can be less secure. Even in a managed environment that takes care of security, you can do something really stupid. <laughs> like um, on Google Cloud, when you set up a managed um, Cloud SQL MySQL database, it gets a public IP, that's not a good idea. There's really no reason why your MySQL database should have a public IP. You don't want that, that's not the point, right? You have Finract, which is the gateway to the database. So demo.finract.dev has a public IP, but the MySQL database that's running on Finract.dev does not have a public IP. So you gotta take care a little bit and know what you're doing there. Um, even on a managed platform. But I do think it makes it a little easier than if you do everything yourself. Um, and then it's the whole credential story. So uh, Google, can, Google or any other cloud provider can do anything they want to secure your cloud deployment. If you, again, don't know what you're doing and you screw something up in your credential with which you use and administer that cloud deployment is not safe, then you're you're in trouble. Um, if this sounds like I'm paranoid, um, which I'm paid to be at work, so I am paranoid, but I, I'm paranoid for a reason because um, these things happen. Um, the Google Cloud test project account key for a previous Google Cloud project that is not related to finrac.dev, but we had a, this was two years ago, I think, um, we had a, an, a, an intern working with us to uh, basically explore Finrac CN deployment to Google Cloud. And the account credential for that cloud deployment actually leaked to GitHub. So basically somebody with a bit of interest there, and believe me, there are people with interest in this, um, could take over that project because the account credential JSON file for the service account was checked into GitHub. Uh, there isn't much a cloud provider can do. Actually, there is some things that cloud providers do this was actually detected by something that flagged this and said, whoa, there's a credential here, checked into GitHub, this is a bad idea. And we took care of it and, and I removed that. But the same applies for local. Um, like if your pe person who administers a cloud account has a Windows machine that is as easily compromised as they are um, and the cloud account credential gets um, uh, stolen there, you can access anything on, on the cloud deployment. That's, that's not something infrastructure can solve. Let's move on to application security. I really need to speed up a bit. Javier, it's possible I go slightly over time. I hope that's okay. Um, we'll just uh, start the buff five minutes late. At the application level, I think there's a number of things. This now has everything to do with Finract and nothing to do with the cloud um, managed environment. Um, we actually had an issue in um, uh, that we fixed in Finract 1.4.0 where uh, credentials were appearing in the URL, which is kind of stupid. It means every intermediate proxy, um, everything at your ISP can theoretically intercept those, um, those credentials, even if you use HTTPS, because the URL in HTTPS 
um, SSL URLs is not encrypted. That's something we fixed in Finrac 1.40. That alone is a reason for everybody to upgrade to 1.40 immediately. But um, that is, of course, your call when you upgrade and how you upgrade. Um, there uh, is uh, always a potential for SQL injections in an application like Finrac or any sort of backend application that offers a REST API. Mm. This is an area where we can still do a little bit better in. We, I think, solved some problems, but there's probably some left. Uh, Manthan, our GSOC intern, is uh, doing some great work around that to replace some string concatenations with some uh, SQL builder. Um, uh, and uh, help on that is, of course, very welcome. If anybody listening to this presentation is a Finrac user who would like to contribute to application level security, please reach out. There's definitely things we can um, point you to that you could help with in, in Apache Finrac. Um, weak passwords, um, Finrac offers uh, two-factor authentication or authentication um, to combat the security threat of weak passwords. I think that's an area where we could do with some better documentation. Exactly how to set that up and how to use that um, isn't super clearly documented. And, and that's an area, another area where uh, community contributions would be great. Um, and you never, you don't know what you don't know, right? That's a stupid old saying, but um, any application can have um, basically just programming bugs. Um, so I'm not saying Finrac has any. In, in fact, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any um, because we would have fixed them if, if we were aware of some big ones. But um, I, what I'm saying here is that in terms of talking about the security of a cloud deployment, such as the Finrac.dev demo, at the infrastructure level, that is what we spoke about so far. At the application level, there, there can be problems. I'm not trying to be alarmist or something here, just distinguishing the different uh, layers of where security problems can arise. And just to sound like a broken record, um, help and security is always very welcome, right? Anybody contributing um, investigations into this and wanting to help fixing things in this area, great way to contribute. All right, moving on. Done with security. Um, Scalability, let's talk a little bit about scale and finrac.dev and how how does this um, how how well does this scale? So Finrac is stateless and Finrac can scale horizontally. Um, it would be relatively trivial to set up finrac.dev to basically start serving requests from more instances, more containers on App Engine. Um, I haven't done it because there aren't many requests. It's a demo instance that people occasionally use, but that would be one way of achieving scalability. Another way would be to break up the application, um, create uh, you know microservices where every API runs in a separate container. Um, I'm personally not entirely convinced that's um, uh, strictly necessary and, and sort of justifies a rewrite of Finrac, but that's a discussion that's not the, the purpose of this presentation here. Um, I do think that modularity in code is much more important as a first step towards a future architecture. Um, but I'm diverging slightly from the, the main um, point of this particular presentation here. Um, something that I do f f feel is worthwhile to throw in here in the discussion of, you know, do you need microservices to have a scalable cloud native architecture? I think some people might be surprised how many um, uh, proprietary, uh, very well-selling core banking solutions um, are very monolithic, right? Um, you might be surprised to know how monolithic some backends of some very, very large um, internet services are. Uh, it, it's sometimes easy to sort of read the latest literature and get into like, whoa, everything has to be a microservice. Let's break everything down into a hundred small pieces where every REST API runs uh, in a separate microservice. Th there's a balance there and yeah, long discussion. Um, the point of the slide is to say that I think Finrac.dev is fine as a, as a demo environment of the Finrac on X architecture. Um, without requiring microservices. Uh, something that is not fine um, that um, needs, uh, that you need to know about if you have any interest in the topic of deploying Finract in a uh, scalable way on a cloud environment, or it's actually not really related to cloud, even if you run a server um, in your basement for your MFI or for your uh, institution, is this whole JDBC driver story. So Finrac ships with a Drizzle JDBC driver. That's an unmaintained project. Um, you absolutely should switch that out against a modern, latest uh, MariaDB 
or MySQL JDBC connector. Um, I think MariaDB is the way to go there. So the MariaDB connector J is highly recommended as the JDBC driver instead of Drizzle. Um, in fact, the Apache, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the Finrack container actually includes such an alternative um, JDBC driver. You just have to configure it. Um, Finrack 982 Jira issue is an idea to completely remove Drizzle. It's a long and complicated story. We don't have time to go in here um, related to um, open source licensing uh, of Apache Server Foundation uh, hosted projects. But, but definitely something worth mentioning in context of uh, scalability in cloud. If we want to push this a little further on the database side, um, I've not done any, any scalability tests here, but um, general anecdotal evidence uh, and experience of other cloud-based systems suggests that if we were interested in scaling up Finrack much more, um, the likely bottleneck that would emerge after we took care of some low-hanging fruits, I'm pretty sure that there is easy low-hanging fruits that we can deal with, where it's like adding missing indices to SQL um, columns and uh, very likely some problems in the Java code. There's probably some performance tuning we can do by profiling the Java code. But sooner or later, we will probably discover that a MySQL database is a performance issue because the MySQL database does not scale out um, horizontally like the application container does. Um, there are a couple of takes on this. Um, one thing that I'm, uh, I don't know much about the scale that some of you um, are interested in, in running Finrack at. Um, I know that at least on a managed environment such as a Google Cloud SQL, you can create a pretty large database. So I think the low hanging fruit here is to say, well, if your database starts to become your bottleneck, you can click a button and get a larger database machine type. You can get a really large database machine type on Google Cloud very easily. Costs, but if you run a huge production environment with, I don't know, gazillions of, of customers, then you pay what it takes for a large database machine. Um, I'm personally quite curious if people run Finract 1.x deployments that are big enough to max out a large MySQL database machine. Um, if you run with, I don't know, like a really large one, um, 32 cores and, and I don't know, uh, 96 gigs of RAM or, or something fancy, um, you have to have a lot of load for the database to still be the bottleneck then. Um, and yeah, I don't know, this is sort of a, a question mark. If, if this was the case, like if you were deploying Finrack in the cloud and really even with choosing and paying for a larger database machine, you would still have an issue. Um, there are a couple of next steps there that, that you could look at and that, that I would consider if, if this was my problem. It's not, I don't run Finrack in production, so it's not my problem, but I'm sharing some ideas here for those of you who are interested in this. I think something interesting there, um, we have a GRA issue open about moving from MySQL to Postgres. Um, I'm not sure that would fundamentally shift this problem to another order of magnitude, right? Postgres, even if it were to be more scalable than MySQL, which I'm not entirely sure is, is uh, empirically proven, um, it would fundamentally still have the same architecture, right? Postgres, MySQL, you can shard them and you can do things like that and, and become fancy, but these are database systems that, that were um, designed for, for sort of a different era. Um, an interesting idea there could be to explore using uh, Google Cloud Spanner, which is a managed database that um, basically has a, a different order of magnitude of scalability. I'm not entirely sure how hard it would be to port Finract from MySQL support to um, something like Cloud Spanner support, but it, it sure could be fun to try if somebody wants to um, sink time into this. Um, again, I think the whole uh, scalability debate is, is, um, is something that should be driven by real need and real monitoring data, right? Um, actually, in terms of what we could do next on, on scalability, if this is an area that interests anybody in this context of cloud deployments, um, I think what we really need in Finract as a community, and I've said this on mailing list posts before, is automated load testing, uh, functional scenarios and 
tools that uh, simulate load. Uh, this is a pretty common thing, and this is something we should have in the community project, something we can you know, rerun across releases. Um, if you have an interest in, in Finract scalability, I urge you to work in the community on load testing, share load testing scripts, uh, raise pull requests where you contribute load, load testing um, scenarios or tools, or even put them in a separate repo and share them with the, with the uh, community. Say, post to the developer mailing list and say, here's my repo where I have a load testing scenario for Finrack. I have run it to a hundred gazillion customers and seen that it crashes. What do you guys think? That would be really useful. I think reports of people who ask questions about scalability, how scalable is Finrack, or I have tested it and found it to not be very scalable, can you fix it, are of much more limited use without reproducible scale test scenarios. So I've made my my uh, my point there. I, I hope this is helpful. Um, I uh, would like to offer finrack.dev, the hosted um, environment of the project for scale testing. If somebody wants to go ahead and start to basically hammer like load test and, and send a lot of requests to finrack.dev, please be my guest. Um, that's totally fine. That's one of the ideas I originally had for, for a sort of constantly up environment. If you crash it, interesting. Let's find out why. Let's see what we can do as a community to improve. And so you can rerun your load test um, and we can we can go from there. I will skip about over the point of the scalability of the scheduler. That's sort of out of time for that. Uh, Multi-region deployments, real quick. So finrack.dev runs in a single region. If you want to build a super high available production deployment, you could consider a multi-regional deployment. Um, this is a fairly advanced setup. Uh, definitely not something um, I'd want to get into for a demo environment. Um, I am personally not entirely sure, again, how scalable even uh, many, many serious Finract production deployments uh, need to be for something else to make sense. This adds complexity in terms of database replication, um, something you wouldn't have at Spanner. Spanner is auto-replicated across regions. Um, but yeah, something something can be looked into, but I think is probably an overkill for many um, for many deployments. Um, where are we with Finrack.dev? And then I'll wrap up. Uh, wrap up. Um, Javier, thanks for giving me a few extra minutes before we wrap this up and go into the buff. The primary goal of the Finrack.dev um, endeavor is achieved. Uh, it works. It has great uptime, as we saw on that slide about monitoring. It keeps magically updating itself. If you click that link, you get to a, a REST URL, which shows you the Git revision that Finrack.dev currently runs on. It's always the latest one. Um, people do use it. The fact that um, I keep getting error reports on my phone about some API having failed occasionally um, is a, a, an indication that people are, are clearly you know, exploring Finrack by using this demo instance. So this was this was useful. This is uh, this is fulfilling a need. Um, it's great uptime. There are basically zero lists uh, complaints on the mailing and developer mailing list about Finrack.dev being down and not being available or something like that. Um, so yeah, it, it works. The mission is, is fulfilled. Is it completely done? Are there still some some things that could be done in the future? There's one big thing I'd like, um, uh, ideally a contribution from from a community member for. Um, this is the content repository setting. So currently, if you upload documents to the dev environment, they work, but then they get lost again. They're they're not perfectly persistent because of what's described in this Finrack 955 issue. Um, I think this isn't a huge amount of work, so any contributions for this, welcome. I'd guesstimate this is a few days at most for somebody who knows a little bit what they're doing. Um, Finrack.dev is a demo instance currently. Um, could this also be used to offer non-demo instances, um, you know, tenants perhaps for, for non-demo purposes? From a technical perspective, that is totally feasible. I think the support model around that is a little bit more interesting. Um, if there are any partners, Finrack uh, partners, implementers, um, integrators who are interested in talking about this, please let me know. And, and I think there are opportunities there maybe to leverage some community resources with um, partner models who would take um, support. Uh, for, for people interested in running non-demo instances. Um, definitely, you've heard me talk about scalability in a couple of slides there. I think work on scalability on the demo instance would be fun. Um, it hinges, I think, on, as a next step on, on people contributing uh, scale test scenarios. Uh, let's wrap it up here. 
Uh, three book recommendations if you want to know more about how to run uh, serious production environments. These three books have a lot of great tips, a lot of background, um, some of which um, are much more details about some of the topics I've touched upon in this presentation. Javier, over to you. I think I spoke too long and everybody disappeared. Javier, you want to take back over? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. It took a bit to connect. Um, okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think that the technical developers have enjoyed this. Uh, I, I took the, the idea of the secret uh, tool that monitor any any private key that you can accidentally log into the system. 